morning. I'm Pastor Marsha Hull, and I'm glad that you could join us on the website right now. Uh, while we are not meeting in the church, we are meeting via the internet, and I'm so grateful that you could join us. We're in the Christmas season, so I hope that your homes are being decorated and your bacon cookies or breads or gifts or whatever you're doing, um, that things are being prepared for the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. So I wanna welcome you today. I wanna to open up in prayer before we go into song and some other things this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a beautiful time to gather via the internet in the name of Jesus Christ. Nothing can stop us from worshiping Jesus Christ. COVID can't, the governor can't, directives can't. So we're grateful that we can freely in this country worship Jesus Christ. God, accept our worship today from our hearts to yours. There's nothing phony about it. We're just simply coming before you and we worship you. So gather with us, teach us your ways, accept our worship and grow us spiritually to become more Christ-like every moment of every day that we take a breath. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first candle represents hope for us as believers, hope that God will send the Messiah, the one who will save us. The second candle represents peace. We long for peace. We live in a world of chaos and discord and violence. But Isaiah prophesied the coming Messiah would bring peace. He says this in Isaiah 11, five through eight. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. 
The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat the straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. Let's pray. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the paths of your Son, that we may serve you in a worthy manner with hearts purified by his coming, who lives and reigns with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. looking at Christmas. We're looking at the Christmas story. It's so engaging to hear people's stories. Usually there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. And we can go back and remember those stories that we're familiar with. We're familiar with our own stories. But it's the characters in the stories that engage people. They keep our interest because it's personal. So we're taking a look at the characters 
from the Christmas story, the first Christmas story. And we're learning what we can glean from each of these as we go along. Last week we learned about Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest and he gave birth, uh, his, he and his wife had John the Baptist, a cousin of Jesus's. And so uh, just to refresh our memory on Zechariah, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth had been praying for years and years to have a child, but they had two big things working against them. The first one was Elizabeth was barren. Her body couldn't produce a baby in the natural realm. And both Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. Now we don't know how old, but they were beyond the natural childbearing years. That much we do know. Two natural obstacles, two natural deficiencies. But when you encounter the power of God and his will, he makes things happen according to his will. Things get done when humankind integrates with God's will, things happen. The point was to the last week's story is when our obedience converges with God's will, the impossible becomes reality. And I love that because I need that in my life. And I know that you do too. And there are some of you out there today who really need to hear some messages of hope because we've been living in a whole year full of hopelessness. So there's hope in these messages. Glean the hope. There's hope for you today. It was true back then, and it is true for us today. There's two critical layers that need to, to happen here. Our obedience and God's will coming together in convergence. Our surrender to what God has planned is the only thing that's holding us back. If we don't surrender, it isn't gonna happen. God uses people. We have to keep that in, in our minds. So whatever you see as your deficiency, your shortcomings, your crutch, your inabilities, remember this, that God has the power to make the impossible a reality in your life as well. In today's story about the first Christmas, I want to tell you another story about a man named Dave. Dave wasn't in the first Christmas story, but I want, I want to tell you about this man named Dave because I think some of us can relate to him. Dave was raised in a strong Christian home, and when sharing his testimony with others, he sometimes refers to himself as a, a lifer because he made a decision to trust God at a very young age. He was eight years old. His parents were involved in different ministries from leadership to missions to children's ministries. They were very engaged in church life. The youth ministry in his church was very strong. Dave needed this ministry in his life while he attended high school. He was in the public high school system. This group was very active and they spent many, many hours together just hanging out, but living life together as teenagers. Now, we're in a position right here at First Church that we're seeking a, a youth director and so I'm hoping one day that we will have this very vibrant, electric, engaging, very active youth group going on. I want you to be in prayer for us here at First Church for this same kind of environment that Dave had. But as Dave and his friends were nearing their graduation, life began to get serious as the future beyond high school was approaching. When Dave graduated, he had no idea what he was gonna do with his life. So he went ahead and he attended college for a year and a half with no real vision, no real direction. Dave had no idea what God's will was for his life. So we're, we're gonna come back to this story about Dave um, a little bit later because right now I wanna take us back to the first Christmas and the character of Mary the mother of our Lord. It all begins one day 
when God interrupts Mary's life with the most amazing plan that was determined long, long, long before Mary was even born. But it's now about to become a reality. What we'll see and be able to put into our lives today from this story is that when God's will is made clear to us and we obey, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. So keep that right here. As we talk about Mary, and we go back and we talk about this Dave guy, and you begin to put the pieces together in your life. Because when God's will is made clear to us and we obey, nothing is impossible. So we found a, a, find a, a powerful conversation taking place in the book of Luke, New Testament. This conversation is between young Mary and the angel Gabriel. At a precise moment in time, God sends Gabriel to the city of Nazareth to a young girl. She was a teenager at this time. Mary is a virgin, not yet married, and she'd never been with a man. This small detail is many times overlooked, but it is critical to this Christmas story. This fact is pointed out through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. We're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament and follow along in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now we jump forward, and Paul tells us something in the New Testament in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. There's a whole lot packed in those verses. But this detail about Mary being a virgin, prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New, this detail is the topic of conversation between Mary and Gabriel. We also know in the text that Mary is betrothed to Joseph. Now let me explain that. In the Jewish custom, this means that they're legally married but they have not yet had a marriage ceremony and they have not yet consummated the marriage in a physical way. This betrothal period lasted for about a year to test the fidelity of the couple. This is very interesting. Gabriel shows up when Mary's relative Elizabeth is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. This divine plan I love this story because it is a divine plan. It's being communicated and explained right now. Gabriel begins with this in Luke chapter 1, verse 28. He says this, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, think for just a minute right here how you might respond to a greeting like this. First of all, I've never had an angel appear to me, let alone speak to me one-on-one. -on -one. Very few people in my life have ever told me that I'm highly favored. So the only thing that keeps me going sometimes is the fact that I know without a doubt that the Lord is with me and I am highly favored according to him. But here's this young teenager receiving this greeting from an angel, and it goes on to say this in verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Think about this scenario. Young teenage woman betrothed legally to a man. This angel comes down, appears to her, speaks to her with God's message. You're favored, Mary, and the Lord is with you. She's confused and she's bewildered. There's nothing in Mary's life that warrants God's special favor. Mary is not a perfect human being. She is, however, the recipient of God's divine 
grace. You see, this is how salvation works. By God's great grace, faith is possible. If it weren't for God's grace to me, I couldn't even have faith in Jesus Christ. So God initiates, we respond. Remember that? God initiates, we respond. So here, God's grace, faith is possible. And God makes a way for imperfect humans like me, torn apart by sin, to have a personal and intimate relationship with him through the child that Mary is going to bring into this world. I think it's really, really, really good to stop and ponder this sometimes. We've been saved. We have been saved for all of eternity because of God's amazing grace that allows us to have faith in Jesus. You can pause the message right now and think about that for a minute because that's, that's huge. Now we're going to go back to Dave for a moment here. Throughout high school and college, church, especially the youth ministry, was very close to Dave's heart. It made a big impact in his life. After he graduated from high school and he returned from some time in college, and since God's plan was still unclear to him at that time, he worked several jobs while he was volunteering in his local church youth ministry. So he wasn't sitting still, he was doing some things. He also traveled on several mission trips. Some were overseas and others were not far from home. And one mission trip would change Dave's life forever. On the drive home, after working with junior high students, takes a special call to do that anyway, um, he, they put on a week-long vacation Bible school for a small country church. God would speak to Dave and um, call him into ministry. This was a very significant moment in his life. The youth pastor spoke these words to Dave and made it extremely clear because Dave was searching for God's purpose. And the youth pastor spoke these words. I think some of the kids' lives were changed forever this very week. These words, these words clarified the direction and purpose to Dave. The direction Dave was lacking, but he was waiting for it. He was searching for it. It was the convergence of God's will and Dave's seeking purpose and direction that came together at that one point. Just as Dave had received God's call, we now see in our text, we're talking about Mary now, that Gabriel shares the details of God's plan with Mary. He gives specifics because what we're seeing from these scriptures is God's will converging with Mary at this time. So let's see. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Unlike Zechariah from last week's message, Mary did not doubt this message from God, but she was very puzzled because she was a virgin. The angel filled her in on this miracle in verse 35. Follow along. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This clarifying statement sets Jesus Christ apart from any other human being ever born. He was a this was a divine conception, not a human conception. While Jesus would be born in the same manner as all other humans, he was not conceived in the same manner, and he will live a sinless life because he is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away 
the sin of the world. There's so much packed into these verses that if we're not careful, we can allow this information to pass by because we're so familiar with this story. The power of this description comes from Gabriel. From last week's message about Zechariah, Gabriel identified himself in Luke chapter 119 as I am Gabriel. He was talking to Zechariah at this time. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you. Gabriel is confirming where he stands and what he's doing. He's being sent to communicate what God wants to be known. What Gabriel communicates to Mary is not his own interpretation of who Jesus is, but this is a direct communication from God identifying his son. That is powerful and that is clarifying, identifying Jesus and the plan that God has by using Mary. What seems like an impossible reality in Mary's eyes is not impossible when God is working. Amen? After Mary understands what is to be done in her role in this divine plan, she humbly identifies herself as a bond servant to the Lord. She commits her life to fulfilling his plan exactly as the Lord has called her to fulfill. As Mary comes to this conclusion and obeys the command of God, Gabriel departs from her. And I love Mary's response found in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now, let's go back to Dave for a minute. The van ride home that day took about eight hours. And in those eight hours, Dave would get some guidance from his youth pastor. Dave went into action mode after he received this clarifying direction from God, go into ministry. Dave went into action. He went home and immediately shared with his closest friend about the Lord's call on his life. He didn't just sit on his hands waiting for some miraculous thing to happen because it already happened. He enrolled in a local Bible college and he followed through with his call into full-time ministry. When God clarifies, we obey. The word obey is a verb. There's movement, there's action. When God clarifies, we act. There's something for us to do. Dave was humbled by this call, and he was committed to obey God. God would shape this obedient servant into a messenger of the good news, and God used Dave for the rest of his life. How often do we sit around waiting for God to show up? Maybe we need to take a look back and actually acknowledge the times that he has shown up in our lives but we've either failed to see it or we failed to obey because it appeared to us to be an impossibility. God's will is not always discovered in dramatic invitation like Mary's, but instead through simple obedience. I want to go to Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 where it gives us some instruction about God's will. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, he's speaking to all the believers. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. As we see in Mary's story, her invitation from one who stands in the presence of God, I'm thinking that I would like that to happen to me with such clarity. But think about that for a minute. God may be showing you 
exactly what he wants you to do. But in your mind, you believe that the task is impossible and you dismiss it as a passing thought of your own. And maybe, just maybe, that impossible task is that invitation from the Lord to partner with his will in some way. I know I'm speaking to all of us today. Mary received the words of Gabriel and was obedient, which made the impossible possible. So let's take a step back. If we've made a decision to invite Christ into our life, we should want to know what our part is in this new family, the family of God. Some of us have been walking with Jesus for a long, long time and still don't know your part. I'm talking to you right now. We have a class for you today at noon right here at this church. It's called Discover Your Ministry. I want you to come. We'll have lunch together and assess how God has designed and wired you for service in the kingdom of God. You'll discover how he wants to use you and your gifts to minister to the church inside and how you can minister to people who don't know yet Jesus outside. I want you to come today, noon. There are some of us who have walked with the Lord for some time and have served faithfully in different ministries throughout the years, but you're not serving now. I simply want to say to you, God is not done needing your service or using you and your giftedness. Get back involved in some way. Please don't sit comfortably while people are hurting, living in darkness, and they don't yet know Jesus. Don't just think somebody else is going to do it. He's calling you to do it. There are some of us who are serving in the wrong ministries, kind of like that square peg in the round hole. It just, it's not working. It just, I'm comfortable. It's a burden. I, it's not me. It's not how you're wired. There is a better fit if this description fits you. Come to the class today at noon. And if you cannot come today, let us know, and we're going to schedule another class so that we'll make a time when you can make it. I don't think Mary asked God to choose her to bring the Messiah into the world. Yet God had a plan. And he sent his messenger Gabriel with this seemingly impossible plan. And Mary's answer, Mary's answer can be your answer. I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May it be to me as you have said. When God's will is made clear in your life, may your answer be, I am the Lord's servant. May it be. Let's pray. Jesus, our answer to you today is, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you say. So, Lord, we're praying today for those who don't know how they're wired, what their giftedness is, what their impossibilities are, Lord Jesus. Make clear the way for them to see. You've got a way to, for, for them to be of great service to the kingdom of God. That there is nothing that can stand in the way of your convergence, your will converging with our obedience. May it be so. You make the impossible possible. So identify to everyone listening today, what is it that you need to use us for? How may we be of service to you, Father God? Make it clear and may our answer be, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you say, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.
want to continue in our worship. We have been singing familiar songs that bring hope and joy and excitement. We have prayed and invited the Holy Spirit to be part of our everyday life and to receive this, these acts of worship. We have been in the word together and, and given our prayer and our response back to him. I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you say. Now we continue in our worship by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. A tithe is a tenth part of your income. Give back to God what he has asked you to do so the work of the local church can keep going. And anything that you can prayerfully give to the offering over and above your tithe, give it so that he may bless you. It'll go to the upkeep of this church building in which we're going to be celebrating 100 years of activity and God's mission here on the corner of 28th and S Streets in Midtown Sacramento. Give so he can bless you. Give and watch what he will do in your life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the ability to give to our local church, the one where we're ministered in, the one where we're called to serve in, the one that we call our church home. Thank you for the ability to give. Thank you, Father God, that we let go of it and you use it as you see fit through the leadership of this church to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost and to grow disciples. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen and amen. Now, as we do wrap up this week in our message, um, we have some wonderful things going on, even though we are not gathering here, there's ways that you can reach out to your community. And it is spoken in our vision. Let's say it together. We exist to worship God, grow spiritually, love others, and serve faithfully. Let me pray for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go and make disciples. Thank you.